it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved, uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. Hi, this is Carol King from Music City, and you're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Uh, 28 years ago, Will had an encounter uh, in Alabama. He was out hunting with a friend when they started getting rocks thrown at them uh, from about 30 yards away. And uh, Will and his friend both looked over and one of these creatures was there. Uh, It's a very fascinating account. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Will to the show. Will, thanks for coming on. Oh, it's a pleasure, my friend. Thank you for having me. The pleasure's definitely mine, Will. And I know 28 years ago, back in 1994, you were in Alabama and um, you had a, a pretty major sighting. If you would take us back to that moment, kind of what were you doing and what happened? Sure. Yeah, I, uh, I actually, I was probably, I was two years, I was 20. I was two years removed out of high school. I played college baseball. It was earlier in November. Uh, a friend, a uh, childhood friend of mine, we were uh, going out to scout some new land uh, that we wanted to do some turkey hunting on. Not going to say that it was necessarily legal. <laughs> Back then in Alabama, you went and found a part of the woods that you would like to hunt, and uh, you know you have no idea who owns it. Uh, later on, I figured out or found out that it was uh, uh, either state owned or owned by the coal companies, and I'll get into that in just a second because uh, that's a part of my story. But uh, he said he found a spot. This is in in the north eastern part of central Alabama. I guess you could almost say that it's uh, it's somewhere midways in between the 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 northern half and the the central half of Alabama. And uh, he said he had found a spot. We traveled to it. We both loaded up both of our four wheelers because he said we would need them. Uh, we found it was a it was an off road on a county road that both of us knew pretty well. The this area was a good thirty five forty five minutes away from where we both live, but. Uh, it's a, it, either an old logging trail or possibly a, uh, there's a lot of mining area up there, a uh, mining land where they would uh, scout for coal and things like that. I, I'm not sure, but it was big enough for both of us to, to get our trucks into. And, uh, we drove back, uh, approximately, I would say two and a half, three miles. Um, the road got to a point to where we, we could not 
access it on our um, our regular vehicles. So we pulled our four wheelers off. Um, we continued down the trail, probably for another two miles. Uh, and this this is really deep. Um, this is a part of Alabama that uh, it's actually sandwiched in between two rivers. Um, you got the Locust Fork and the Mulberry, both of them that dump into the Warrior. There's no houses, no developed property, very few county roads that might cut through the area. If that'll tell you how deep we were, but uh, we finally got to a point to where, you know, we were spending more time dodging trees and ditches and things like that on our four wheelers. We finally just climbed off and we started walking. Uh, at the time, I didn't. Now that it comes back to me, I realize we did not hear any sounds. We did not hear any animal life. Uh, being young guys, talking about women and other things that are on your mind at that age, we um, we really didn't notice it, but we had already walked approximately, we'd been walking 45 minutes, Wes, so um, I would think that we were another at least half mile in, maybe a mile. Now, he was behind me a few steps, I don't know, probably 10, 15 feet. And that's when the first rock came in. Now, this rock came in from our right, and it landed dead in between the two of us. I heard it. He saw it when it landed. I turned around to see it, and he's looking down at it, and we both look at each other. And then we both look in the direction of where it ob obviously came from. We didn't see anything. Uh, there was nothing there. We both at the time, thought the same thing. We thought that obviously somebody's messing with us, right? Because, you know, we're in Alabama. Uh, at that time, the wildlife, you got deer, you got turkey, you got things of that nature. We have bear in Alabama now, but at that point, we didn't. And we obviously have the, the cougar and the mountain lion that they still say is not here, but everybody knows it is. But there's nothing that could have thrown that rock except for a human being, or so we thought. So we actually conversated about it for a second. You know, what is going on? You know, who the hell is up here? I don't see anybody. We didn't talk about it, but bo it both crossed our minds at the time. We're in the middle of nowhere. Nobody knows that we're here. We are nowhere near a subdivision, a house, a farm, anything. And I think it put both of us on uh, pretty unnerved. Uh, I think both of us were, were thinking in the back of our heads you know, running through our minds, you know, what, what could it be? Tried to brush it off. We carried on. Uh, we're walking approximately another 30 minutes or so. What we're trying to look for is a bunching of trees that's close enough that we can put a turkey blind in, um, that we actually made our own homemade turkey blinds and we needed a tree that, uh, or a sapling, something that separated approximately, you know, five to six feet apart that uh, we could uh, anchor it to or get it up. It was about that time that the second rock came in. Now, when this rock came in, it was more up towards me. And I caught it out of the periphery of my vision. Now, it came in from the right again. I caught it in midair as it's coming from the side. And instead of watching the rock or doing anything, I immediately whipped my head around to see where it came from. And 60, 70 feet, no more than 30 yards. <sighs> there that big son of a gun was. Now, where we were walking, there's a gentle slope. We were in kind of a gentle valley, so you got rises on either side of us. Right under a big white oak tree is just a massive creature. And I pointed. I pointed and I said, look. That's when he turned around. Now, by the time I said, look, he had already started to turn. And I call it he because I was able to differentiate his gender from that, from that uh, vantage point. He had already started to turn. So I caught him almost at, you know, a, a straight on look. By the time he looked, it was, he was turning and he saw him at a profile, my friend. 
saw him at a profile and I'll, I'll keep his name out of it. And I, we, I was able to see him. He was slightly over the rise, could see him from about his knees up. And all I can assume that when he turned, he was headed back. So he turned to his left and I'm assuming he was headed back to his right with the way he was facing us. And the reason I say that, he did almost a full 180 and started walking the opposite direction. He turned, and when he did, he turned at the hips, didn't turn his head, his shoulders, his head, everything moved, and gave us one more look, and then two more steps, and he was gone. Now, at, at this point, I'm already – the the shock had had worn off of me by then. Obviously, you see something like this, Wes, and you're looking at something that does not exist. This is a fairy tale. This is a hoax. These are creatures that are on point with, uh, you know, fairies and goblins and things of that nature. So it takes a second to register that in your head. I've obviously I've I've been researching these things. There was no smell. Um, there was no kind of odor. But by the time he had turned and started to disappear, I was gone. And just instinctively, I believe my friend, he was in tow with me. Neither one of us had firearms on us at the time. You know, we were just going to scout a place out. They're pretty uh strict on hunting laws in Alabama, at least they were at that time. We really didn't want to be caught in the woods out of hunting season with any type of firearm on us. But it took us only about, and I'm, I mean, I'm at that point, I'm an in-shape guy. You know, I'm a college baseball player. And uh, it took eight to ten seconds at most to get to the point where he was at, where we saw him. Now, when we get to the top of this rise, as you look down, this is old-growth forest. Very few evergreens. You might have a cedar tree here or there. You're talking about uh, maples and white oaks and hickories. And most of them, a majority, are very large trees. So these trees are spread out. And we're talking about the fall in Alabama. So all your underbrush has died at this point. And we get up there, and you can see. Obviously, there's trees obstructing your view periodically, but you can see in every direction for hundreds of yards, hundreds of yards. And he was gone, gone. And now we're both obviously getting, you know, freaked out. My adrenaline's pumping. His adrenaline is pumping. Now, here's the weird thing about it. When we got to the point where he was at, there was a, how do I explain it? Um, like a static electricity charge. So your hair is standing on end, and it's not from the fear, and it's not from the excitement. This is a, this is a, a, a tangible feeling that you can feel. Like I could feel it through my body. It almost kind of like grabbing a low voltage electric fence you know what i'm saying you can you could feel this charge we could both feel it there's this charge that that you could feel almost like you walked into a wall of energy we're both feeling it and one part that i did leave out so this white oak tree that he's under all right there's a there's a limb that was coming down that he was almost directly under and the smaller branches of that the the lowest one that dipped down when when he turned to leave he slightly now he walked with a with a slight hunch anyway he walked with a with a, a forward motion anyhow but he had to dip slightly to get under that branch whenever whenever he left and the other thing that was weird Wes so we saw him from the knees up when he left it looked like he was on a an escalator. I mean, he, you didn't see the bounce in the steps. It's almost like he just, uh, like he just dissipated. Not that he disappeared, but his body, almost like he was on an elevator, an escalator, the way that he, he moved over the ridge. 
my buddy by this time, he's he's freaking out, and he he's let's go, let's go, I want to go, let's go. Uh, and I'm sitting there, you know, wait a minute, man, hold on, let me see, let me, I can't see where he's gone. He, I don't give a damn where he's gone. Let's go. So we head out. Uh, we get back to the four wheelers. We ride out. We get back to our trucks. Uh, we take the time to load them up. Uh, the whole time, nothing else happened to us on the way out. However, that whole walk out, the whole mood had changed. Now, I don't know if it was because we thought we were being watched or we were being watched. But you, you could tell the air was thick. It, it, it was uncomfortable. Uh, you were always on point just in case something happened. And the only way to describe it is, um, and I know some people can't, un unfortunately, through bad decisions in my life, I put myself in situations where, you know, when you walk into a situation and something's not right, you know, you know, something's about to jump off, uh, whether it be a fight or, or something of that nature. And that's all I can compare it to. But we, we got back out, got our gear loaded up. Uh, I told him, Hey, meet me down at, at uh, the bottom of the county road where there was a service station that was still a good, I don't know, six, seven miles away from the, the point that we actually went into the woods. And we got down there and I'm, I'm excited, not so much terrified, but excited. My, my adrenaline is going, he was terrified. Wes, he did not want to talk about it. He didn't want to acknowledge it. And I'm sitting there going, man, dude, do you realize what we just saw? Do you not realize? And I think I even used the words, how fortunate, how lucky we were. And he was completely on the opposite side of the fence. Um, he didn't, he did not want anything to do with it. He said he wasn't going to tell anybody about it. He was not going to mention it. And I've always been the type of person, Wes, I, I really couldn't care less what people think about me. I, I don't. And um, so that day we wound up going back, going back to the house. And when I got home, uh, I did tell my dad about it. My dad was skeptical at first, which I think most people, and you got to understand too, Wes, at, at this time in the eighties, nineties, this is a, this is a Alaskan Canadian, uh, Northwest scenario. So there's, you don't have these sightings in the Southeast. You don't have these sightings. I didn't even know of any in the Midwest, you know, obviously with social media and the access that we have to information now, you know, it, it's educated us on a lot of things. Yeah, I agree. I, I think having access to information really has changed things. And, you know, after people have encounters now, they can go, you know, type it on online what they heard and uh, different sounds will come up and hearing other people's encounters. I do think that I agree with you. I, I do think that having access to information has changed a lot. And I understand your mindset, you know, being down there in the South and thinking, well, if this thing is real, it's probably in the Pacific Northwest, but there's a long history of it down South, you know, the Alabama white thing. Uh, there's a lot of things down South where rarely will you ever hear an old timer say Bigfoot or Sasquatch. They'll call it wood booger. They always have like a different name for it. Um, before we go into uh, descriptions, cause I'm really curious on what you saw when you went and spoke to your dad, what did your dad say? Okay, so, and you're right. After I've been researching it on that point, they got the downy booger. They've got the, uh, oh, and I'm trying to think of the other one, and it's slipping my mind. It's down towards southern Alabama, towards Greenville. But so so my dad, and he's open-minded too. And, and Wes, it's so fascinating how this opens up the dialogue and the conversation. Okay, so my dad grew up in the big thicket in texas in the 30s and 40s and uh, believe it or not at at this time my grandmother we called her texas grandma she's from texas but my grandmother his mother 
was living with us in a guest house beside us. He actually told me, he said, well, I tell you what, he said, come over here and talk to Texas grandma. And we went over there, come to find out they lived in the big thicket on a farm, dirt road, typical parent story, walking uphill both ways in the snow. Well, he did. So the, the, the road they had to walk to get to his bus stop when he was young, they had to walk three or four miles down a country road and a huge solid wood fence, approximately eight to 10 feet tall bordered that whole property that they walked. And the reason he went to go talk to her is she told me a story about when she was walking dad to school on the other side of that fence something paced them the whole way. This was before the sun came up. So they're, they're walking at, uh, before daybreak. Uh, so they're, they're at night when they're walking him to school. And she said that when they would walk, it was evident. It was big. It was heavy. And when they would stop, it would stop. When they would start walking, it would start walking. They abandoned school that day. They got about halfway because my grandmother knew at the end that fence ended, that 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 fence quit. And she was not taking the chance on walking the remainder of that path and coming face to face with whatever was on the other side of that fence. And she thought it was a panther. Now, the way my dad remembers it, it was too heavy. It was too big to be a cat. And my grandmother even said it did not sound like and have the motions of a cat. So my dad was open to it. Now, he wanted to, are you sure nobody was messing with you? You know, the common questions you're going to get. Was your dad, was somebody messing with you? Was, are you sure that it might not have been a bear? You know, are you sure that it, it, you didn't just see something? I'm like, dad, no. Okay. This thing was no more then 80, 90 feet away from me. I'm thinking around 60 or 70 when I, and I'll get into that. When I went back, I wish I would have measured and I did, but I did go back and I'll get into that here in just a second. But no, he, he was full. He said, well, son, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. He said, I'm of the opinion that, that it's possible. I'm of the opinion that could be real. He said, the only thing I've got, the only argument I would have, especially here in Alabama, is how in the world are they going undetected? How in the world are they able to stay hidden something that large? And it's a good point. I mean, I mean, that's one of the better arguments for the naysayers out there, Wes. It really is, man, especially in like Alabama. I mean, obviously, you've got a lot of woods and wooded areas, but it's impossible to get lost in Alabama. If you walk one direction for a certain amount of time, you're going to hit civilization. You're going to hit a dirt road. You're going to hit something. Yeah. And I think it's a fair question your dad asked. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a question I can't answer. It's when skeptics say that to me, I'm like, that's a great question. I don't have a great answer for you. Uh, you know, if they were only in the Pacific Northwest, you could kind of give the BS answer of like, wow, there's so much land out there, you know, there's places untouched and, uh, but that argument starts to fall apart when you start, you know, talking about other states. Uh, going back to your encounter, how big was the rock that it threw at you? All right. The first one that he threw, I could fit it in my hand. So probably uh, four or five inches across by three or four inches wide and maybe an uh, uh, inch and a half thick. That's a big rock to throw at someone, you know, we're talking 70, 80 feet. Uh, that's a pretty big rock, you know, hits you in the head and you're in trouble. Uh, what's weird is when they throw rocks, uh, most of the time they land at people's feet. And that's how a lot of eyewitnesses uh, describe it. But in my opinion, I mean, that, that seems to be amazing accuracy to have it land in, in someone's you know, right in front of someone as opposed to hitting them. Um, so this thing's about 70, 80 feet away. Can you kind of describe what you saw? Yes, absolutely. The hair on it was, this one was black. Now a majority of it was black, but the hair, the end of his hair was gray. So you could, you could see 
the, the black coat, which was a majority of it, but it almost looked like the, the ends, the follicles that, that went back up towards its, its chest and its body. The hair was, was obviously thicker. Uh, now, he didn't have his arms up, but you could tell around the shoulders and uh, across the back and on top of the head. The hair was longer. The hair was thinner on the stomach area and uh, possibly a, a little bit thinner going down the legs until it got uh, towards its, its lower, towards its knees and so forth. But you could see there was gray. So I'm thinking to myself that this was an older animal because I could see where there was gray or white meshing in to, to his, his hair. And it, wasn't, it was not fur. It was hair. Uh, there, I have no doubt in my mind about that. This was just a very hairy covered giant beast. It wasn't until later that I started doing research. I think that is a genetic thing here in Alabama because there are so many sightings of white ones, white or silver. And I'm starting to think, and so the area that we were in, by the way, the crow flies, uh, from me doing my research, there have been uh, half a dozen or more sightings less than 15, 20 miles away. I'm almost thinking that this is a, a, a genetic thing, uh, Wes. I'm, I'm thinking that up until a certain point as they grow and they mature, that their hair color changes. I, and now that I'm thinking about it, maybe the one I was looking at was not that old. Maybe he was just now reaching his, his peak, his maturity. So I know he was massive, all right? And that's one thing. When I, when I listen to your shows and when I listen to these things, I really think that people severely underestimate the weight. I know people will say that they're eight feet tall, eight and a half, at least, you know, three or 400 pounds. No, no, sir. And I'll tell you exactly how tall he was. He was over seven foot, eight and three quarter inches. And I'll get back to, to how I know that. I would say at the shoulders, probably over three and a half to four feet at the shoulders. Huge, huge, massive shoulders, huge traps, huge uh, neck muscles. The head, again, set recessed right on top of the shoulders. There was a slight conical shape to the top it wasn't exaggerated but, but you could tell it was there he did have somewhat of a pronounced brow ridge eyes were dark uh, and i can't say that i, I actually saw whites I, I can't say that he was shaded a little bit obviously standing under that tree but massive pecs massive just <sighs> Just, Wes, he was just big, man. <laughs> yeah. So the arms, the arms, again, as he stood up, I would say that his fingertips would come down to the bend in his leg was, was where his fingertips would come down. Huge hands. Now, the bottom part, the, as far as his legs and uh, his thighs, and so forth like that. I've seen the Patty film. I've seen other things. He was not as as thick on his lower body as I thought he probably should have been. Still muscular, you know, way bigger than, than anything I, I've ever seen. But compared to his upper body, I almost thought that that probably should have been a, a slightly bigger, if you see what I'm getting at. Were you able to see any of the uh, facial expressions or kind of what his face looked like? Yeah. So his face, he was not, I didn't see teeth. I didn't see mouth, non-existent lips, almost non-existent lips. The mouth covered the full area of the face all the way across. So this, this cat could have probably eaten two apples whole and the nose was flat but not the nostrils still face down they didn't point out so the the nose was flat and obviously more exaggerated for his size so it spread out 
a majority of his face. But I'm telling you right now, Wes, what I was looking at, in my opinion, was was not an eight. It, it I couldn't bring myself to draw down on one just because I think the guilt would be there that I actually killed a a human. He made no facial expression to us. His face stayed, stayed pretty stoic through the whole encounter. Now, obviously, when I whipped my head around, he was in the process of turning. So I had maybe a split second to make these features out. Oh, and small ears. Small ears. Like the, That's the one thing that I, I could not get over. The ears just were not the size I thought they should have been for a creature that big. And you could barely see him through the through the hair, through the, the mat, you know. And and the hair was very unkept coming off of his head. You could tell it was it was it was scraggly. You can definitely see the, the animal side in their features, but at the same time, I can't look at a you look at a gorilla or a chimpanzee or an orangutan, any type of primate, and You'll never bring yourself, obviously, you look at them and you say, yes, they, they have human features to them, but you'll never be able to bring yourself to say, I think they look more human than, than animal. Not this, not this. And you know what? Maybe our opinion or our, what's the word I'm looking for, our evaluation on them, maybe it gets skewed a little bit, Wes, because they walk on two feet, for God's sakes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, a lot of hunters will say that. They'll say, you know, I couldn't shoot it because it was so human-like. And I'm curious about your opinion on that, you know, as far as, you know, not being able to shoot it. Was it the fact that it was on two legs standing like a man? Or was it something in its appearance? And uh, I'm not breaking balls. I'm just curious on on that that feeling of like, hey, I can't shoot it because it looks human-like. Now, obviously, now, let me, let me go back. If my life were threatened, I'll drop him in a heartbeat, partner. I mean, that, that's just all there is to it. You know, self-preservation will kick in. If I felt threatened, yes, I would. But you know what? If my life's in danger with a, with a regular human being, I'll take you out too. You know, I, that's, just, that, that's just where I stand on that. But I think it's a combination of things. I think it's a combination of, it's walking on two feet. It's a combination of they've got human-like features and just a, a combination of the damn shock. I, I, I just don't think – you can't think clearly in that moment. I mean, you, you, you just can't seem to calm down and be able to process thoughts in order to, you know, make rational decisions. I think some people are better than others, but I know in the initial sighting, I just, uh, I was frozen. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at a fairy tale. Yeah, I hear you. And I, and I think a lot of people go through that, you know, when you see one, it's like, this isn't real. Um, and it's so shocking to see it. Just like you said, uh, can I ask you really quick about the rock throwing uh, behavior? And I know that you don't know and I don't know, and I'm just very curious on your opinion. Uh, we hear this a lot from my witnesses that they throw rocks at people. And for me, I'm sitting here thinking for such an elusive animal that uh, seems to run and hide is impossible to catch up with. You know, no one has been able to really catch up with this thing. And you know, it's known for being elusive, and yet it starts throwing rocks in your general direction uh, to get your attention for some reason. Well, what do you make of that behavior? Well, and see, I, I try to reason this out, man. What I'm thinking, so we were in a very remote area. What I believe, I believe it was just, that was its home. You know, this this is my space. This is my area. This is where my family is. I'm not used to having intruders here. And it's very possible that we were walking up on, maybe we were getting too close. You know, maybe maybe we were stepping in. I don't know if, if it had a family, if it had young, if it, but we were headed possibly in the general direction of somewhere it didn't want us, want us to go. 
And I think it, it wanted us out of there. Do I think if we were walking in an area that, uh, that we might not have stumbled up on something that he didn't want us to see, I possibly, he just would have kept his eyes on us, stayed in, in the cut and stayed hidden and, and kept his eye on us until we did our business and walked right back out. But I think a large part of these encounters, Wes, are people who are, however you want to look at it, either wrong place, wrong time, or right place, right time. If you're getting too close to somewhere they don't want you to be, then they'll break cover. They'll break cover and they'll let you know, and they'll, they're going to do something to get you, to get you out of that area. And, and that. That was that's my my theory on it. That's the only thing I could figure. Yeah, and that theory actually makes sense to me. I know you've been kind of really looking into this over the last twenty eight years, and uh, it, it's cool to hear your take on it. Um, let me ask you: so you're watching it, your buddy turns, looks at it as it's turning, and it walks away. Um, and you mentioned it; it just kind of you didn't see it anymore. Did it, do you think it hid behind a tree? Did it just vanish? No, like I said, so we were, we were in, I'm not going to call it a valley, but so where we were walking was, and, and obviously in the woods, hunters know this, it's, it's easier to walk in either valleys or on ridges, you know, just because it's the only flat area you got. So where we were at, you had a gentle slope that went up on either side. He was just on the other side of that slope under this tree. I don't, Wes, I don't know if it was three seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds that time just kind of stood still when we, when we finally made, uh, you know, uh, got eye contact on it. But when he turned and I really wish, you know, hindsight 2020, I wish that I would have took off towards it the second I saw it because we gave him time to take those. I say two steps. I didn't see the steps. It wasn't maybe one second or more that he disappeared and dropped behind that ridge. And it wasn't until he dropped behind that ridge that we started running up there. But I will tell you this, there is no possible way, none that a normal person, any other animal, anything could have got out of eyesight by the time we got up there. In, it, absolutely impossible. He didn't go behind a tree. He just took those steps and disappeared behind that ridge. And that ridge, once we got up to the slope, we saw that the backside was a little steeper. The grade was, was steeper uh, than we, we thought. Uh, but at the same time, man, uh, he was too massive. Uh, yeah, we got some big trees out there, but uh, his shoulder width, there, there wasn't a tree down there that he could hide behind. There, there's, no, there's no possible way. And, and the other thing that has, that has weighed so heavy on me is that static charge, that electricity. And it, uh, I mean, it was, you could feel it. I mean, it was on your body. But the thing is, once we got up there, we felt it strong. But then after a few seconds or whatnot went by, it slowly dissipated. So it, it kind of fell off of you. There's something up with that. Yeah, that part really fascinates me. I remember reading that in your email, and I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, before we talk about going back and kind of what you found, um, you know, that static electricity in the air, what's kind of your take on that? I mean, what do you think that was? I don't know, but it's exactly how I know they're always around. It's not the last time I felt it, Wes. Every time I'll get that exact same electrical charge, and I know that there's one around me. And it's happened five times since that encounter. This was my only sighting, but I, I 100% there have been almost near half a dozen times that I know that I've, I've been around one. And how I figured that out, I think I mentioned to you in my email, and I asked if you had ever had any guests or talked to any witnesses that, that have like a, since their encounter, do they have an emotional awareness or like a psychic residue 
that clings to them after they have a sighting if they're around another one. And you know what? A lot of witnesses, and, and don't get me started on that, Wes, I'm 100% sure there, there are hundreds of thousands of people who have seen these things. It's just the stigma and, the, you know, being ostracized for coming out with it is why we don't have as many reports as we do. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. A, a lot of eyewitnesses talk about uh, they can go back to or go to an area and almost kind of tell you if these things are around after they've encountered them. And I don't really have a great answer for why that is. Uh, it's something I've even experienced. And I've likened it to um, uh, kind of a ghost encounter. Uh, and I, I, I've gone into it a million times. I won't retell a story. But it was kind of that same type of feeling like, something is very off here something is very wrong and you you do kind of get that sense and i'm not really sure how to articulate that but a lot of eyewitnesses talk about that feeling of i can almost kind of tell you when they're around it's strange the thing about mine though is is i actually get a a physical feeling in other words that same feeling i felt when i talk about you know, grabbing a hold of a uh, of a low voltage electrical fence, that charge that you feel going through your body, that's what I get. So it, that's what's weird about it. It's it's almost like I've I don't know. I feel like it's something that I was not supposed to experience. It, it, it's something that a, an an ability they have that they use that I was not supposed to experience. And now anytime one is around, it's almost like a, like a, a tracking device, like a, a beacon or something. It, it, and I'll get into how I figured out that's, that's what that was. Cause I don't ever experience that. I don't feel that feeling. How, how can I explain it? it? It's, it's not like a, uh, like a sixth sense feeling. It's an actual feeling. It's an, it's an actual charge that I'll feel in my body. And I, I, I don't know, dude, I don't know how it's to explain it. I mean, I, you know, and I, I'm glad that I've listened to a lot of your, your episodes because, you know, I, I, I don't feel near as crazy because I've, I've heard a lot of fantastic things on your show. And, and trust me, you can talk to somebody and know when they're lying. You, you know, some, some things people can make up and some things people can't. This is just it. I mean, this is this is what's happened to me, and this is what's been going on since. Yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. It's more of a physical, you know, physical effect more than uh, kind of a, a feeling of dread or that sort of thing. Uh, it, it's fascinating. I wish I had a great answer for you on it, but I don't. And I do appreciate you sharing that. Tell me, you, you ended up going back to the location, and, and what happened? Okay, he was done, okay? Uh, and I'll get back to that later. His mother came up to me almost a decade later asking me, and I hadn't seen her. We actually kind of lost touch after that. And he, his mother came up almost a decade later, Wes, and said, what happened? And I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to tell you about that. But, and it, it wasn't the next day. It was actually the next week, and I'll tell you what I did. I, I made the mistake. So the, the other person that I told, I had a, a friend of mine who um, was quite a few years older than me who went to, got his criminal justice degree, and he was actually the local or the area game warden in that part. It was three or four days later I saw him and told him about my encounter and Wes he was evasive I could tell that there was information there was something he was not telling me but he said you know we've gotten reports like that before he said uh, and then he was very interested what area were you in where, where, where exactly were you at off what county road how far down were you on the county road so he's, he's, he's just absolutely drilling me for information. And I didn't mind telling him, uh, you know, I, I didn't mind saying, uh, you know, where it was or, or what happened, but I was going to get answers. You know, I, I knew that I could probably find 
that area again because uh, I knew exactly where we walked. I knew exactly where we were at. There was a overblow that was in there, a tree that was down not more than probably 50 yards in front of us before we had our encounter. Uh, and we had no other down trees in our path. So I knew that if I walked that same path and got to where that overblown tree was, that I could, I could find the, the spot. And I grabbed a tape measure. And this is a week later. Now, granted, I told him three days, the game warden, three days after my encounter, this would have been, this was on a Saturday, so like Tuesday, I told him the following Saturday, I drive back up there and there is a gate, a pole across that entrance. There is a, a pole with a posted no trespassing that's been welded, put up, and chained and padlocked across that entry. Right then, I, I knew. I said, this, is, this may be deeper than I want to go, but I, I, this something's going on. There's something is, and it's really opened up. I'm probably too far overboard on conspiracy theories, but don't get me started on the government and, and their line ass. But, so I've got my truck. And I've got my four wheeler. So I park my truck there and I pull my four wheeler off and I hack down the underbrush that's on the side of this. And I pull my four wheeler around and I drive. I go back there and I find it. Now, the whole time that I'm in there, I don't have that, that, that feeling. I don't have that big feeling of being watched. I don't have that electrical charge feeling that I'm talking about. There's actually birds. There are squirrels jumping around. It just felt different. The air was lighter. There was, it just seemed like a, a, a normal day in the woods. And I went to the tree. I dropped the tape measure from that bottom branch that I saw it dip under. And that was, it was seven foot eight, three quarter inches is, is where it came to. Give or, give or take a half inch. And he had to duck. To go under it so it had to have been eight feet at least eight feet um no no more than that you know again give or take two or three inches so i walk around a bit i'm looking i, I want to see this thing again i'd already got it in my mind if i see it if it stops if it just if if we have a stare off i'm gonna try to wave at it i'm gonna tr i'm gonna try to do something I'm going to try to do something to get my answers. And, but I didn't have it. It wasn't there. I drove or walked back out to where my four wheeler was because I had to drop it off again. By the time I got back out to the gate, there was a county cop sitting behind my truck. He starts just jumping on me. He, he's, what are you doing here? Did you not see that sign? This is no trespassing. You clearly are in violation. You know, this is criminal trespass. And I said, hey, look, man, I said, I was just here. And I flat out lied. I said, I was just here a week ago. I said, you know, me and a friend of mine, we were working for looking for some uh, uh, spots to put some some turkey blinds. You're not supposed to be hunting on this property anyway. This is this is on this is coal. Uh, this is a uh, coal land. You're not supposed this is private property. You can't be on it. I said, I understand that. I said, but I dropped a knife that my grandpa gave me, and that was a lie. Um, I said, I dropped a knife that my grandpa gave me. I was going back to look for it, and I think that's the only thing that kept me out of jail. He, he was wanting to arrest me, but now I'm thinking, what is going on? And the only thing I can think of, I know my friend wasn't talking about it because he wouldn't even talk to me. I know my dad didn't say anything, so I put two and two together. The only other way that all this could have transpired is my conversation with my other friend who was a game warden. Now I'm thinking to myself, this, this is, this is going a lot deeper than I ever would have imagined. So now somebody knows something and they're covering it up. Why are you all of a sudden blocking off a path? Oh, and here's the other thing. I couldn't give him exacts about which, which, cut off that we turned and I said hey it's about you know two or three miles down on county road so when I'm driving out 
there's probably, I don't know, two or three other cutoffs that go in there. All of them have poles up now. Yeah, it makes you wonder. I mean, it, it's one of those things to where it's a strange coincidence that you told your friend who's a game warden now they shut down access to, you know, that land. Uh, it's very, very strange. You know, 20 years ago, this happened to you. How did this kind of affect your life since then? It completely opened up the door to the rabbit hole. I started studying. I started researching any free time that I had. Well, let, let me go back. So I didn't have a lot of time because of, of the the ball that uh, I was playing. I, like I said, I was a baseball player, and I was trying to make a run at, uh, um, you know, going as far as I could. Um, I wound up having knee surgeries, and uh, and I'll be honest, I was really, really bitter uh, for a long time after I, I, my ball career was over. I, I made a lot of poor choices probably for, you know, better part of eight, nine years. Um, so the subject was always in the back of my mind, but I didn't pursue it. Obviously, things got better and, uh, you know, straightened myself up. But uh, once I did, then I was wanting answers. I, I want to be, I know you're going to blast me for this, but uh, I want to be face-to-face with one. I, I want to stand front and center in front of one because I know there are negative experiences out there. I know that, uh, that these things can be aggressive. I truly believe that their personalities are as varied as ours are. I just, I got to have those answers, man. I mean, if, if there's any possible way that I can sit there and, communicate with one if there's one if there's a way that i can i don't know man i i just got to get more answers than what i've got now it's consumed a piece of of my life you know not to the point to where you know i'm not a a, a functioning citizen obviously but uh and i don't know it's my number one on my bucket list and i don't know if i'll ever accomplish it yeah, I'm not going to blast you, Will. I understand where you're coming from. You know, people, even eyewitnesses who have uh, terrifying encounters, you know, where uh, they really feel like they're it could have gone either way, whether they made it or not. A lot of times I'll even ask those people, would you want to see one again? And they'll the knee-jerk reaction is to say no, but then they'll stop for a second and go, yeah, I would like to see one again. And I think... Uh, the reason is, you know, much like what you said, when you first see it, you kind of go into shock. You're not really, you know, this isn't supposed to be real. Now you're seeing something that isn't supposed to exist, and there it is. And so you kind of want that moment back to where you're hoping you won't be in so much shock the next time. Uh, I get where you're coming from. I mean, I would caution you on running up on one, but, uh, you know, you're a grown man. You, you can do what you want. I, I don't know that I would, but... That doesn't mean anything either. You know, who cares what I would do as opposed to what someone else might do? Uh, let me ask you, you know, again, after 28 years of really looking into this, and I know you're searching for answers, uh, what do you think that these creatures are? Kind of what, what's your thoughts on that, Will? And, and again, there's no wrong answer. And I've heard you ask this question before. I believe that they are primitive humans with primitive habits who have developed extraordinary capabilities from being perfectly adapted to their environment. That's the best way that I could, that I could explain it, Wes. I mean, um, just their, their characteristics, their, their personality, the way that they carry themselves. I just don't think that they're that far off from us. Um, I mean, you know, you've heard, uh, that, uh, you know, a chimp's DNA is, I don't know what, 98%, 98.5% uh, of what ours is. These these guys, I, I think they fall in the category of 99% plus. Yeah, it's kind of hard to disagree with that. I mean, it depends. You know, if you go off uh, Dr. Ketchum's study, you're right on. Uh, I know other people think it's uh, a monkey. I really don't think it's a monkey. I don't think it's a non-human primate running around. Um, you know, so I, you may not be too far off. I would love for it just to be, you know, a non-human primate we haven't caught up with, but 
that really doesn't seem to be the case. You know, when you get into language and a lot of what you said, Will, you know, personality and, you know, I understand the way you feel uh, regarding your encounter. And thank God I didn't really go south on you because it could have pretty quick or, you know, those rocks that they throw. Like I said, one of those gets you in the head and you're in big trouble. And I know I'll be having you back for a part two, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, but Will, thank you so much tonight for taking the time to come on and uh, share your encounter. I, I enjoyed hearing uh, your experience and kind of you going through the details of what you saw. I enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you again for coming on. Oh man, it's been a pleasure, man. And, and like I told you earlier, you are doing a invaluable service, bringing awareness uh, to this subject, man. And just, uh, you know, don't let anybody tell you different. Keep up the good work. I know you said a few times that you wish that they would be found and you could go on and do something else. But man, I, I think you got your calling, brother. And I, I love I love the space where you're at. And, uh, you know, please just keep up your good work and, uh, and don't let the government or anybody else shut you down. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for the kind words. Not a problem, my friend. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone.